Insurance, presented by Kelly Herzig. In this lesson, we will cover insurance terminology, classification of insurance, insurable interests, the insurance contract, key insurance contract provisions, interpretation of insurance contracts, the duties and obligations of the parties, and cancellation. Protecting against loss is one of the major concerns of any property or business owner. No one can predict when an accident, a fire, or other loss might occur, so individuals and businesses usually try to protect against loss by buying insurance. We will begin this lesson with insurance terminology. Insurance is a contract in which the insurance company, the insurer, promises to pay or compensate another party, either the insured or the beneficiary, for a particular loss. Insurance can cover such losses as the injury or death of the insured or another party, damages to the insured's property or damage caused by the insured to another's property, or other types of losses such as those resulting from professional malpractice, those resulting from other types of negligence, or resulting from lawsuits. Insurance is ultimately an agreement for transferring and allocating risk of loss. Risk can be described as a prediction concerning potential loss based on known and unknown factors. An insurance contract is called a policy. The consideration paid to the insurer for coverage under a policy is called a premium. The insurance company, which is the insurer, is sometimes also referred to as an underwriter. The person purchasing insurance is called the insured. In the insurance context, a beneficiary is one who receives the benefits of a policy, such as the payment of the amount of a life insurance policy after the insured's death. Insurance is often obtained through an agent who normally is employed by the insurance company or through a broker who is ordinarily an independent contractor. An insurance agent is the agent of the insurance company, not the agent of the applicant for insurance, and they owe the insurance company fiduciary duties. Generally, the insurance company is bound by the acts of the agent when they act within the scope of the agency relationship with the insurance company. In contrast, usually the broker is the agent for the applicant trying to obtain insurance. In most instances, state law governs the insurance relationship, though federal laws do play a role, particularly in health insurance like COBRA and the Affordable Care Act, which we've discussed in previous lessons. Insurance is classified according to the nature of the risk involved. Different types of insurance apply to different types of risk because the types of losses that are expected and reasonably foreseeable vary with the nature of the activity or property being insured. On the next few slides, I will present the most common insurance classifications by type of insurance and what each covers generally. We will begin with accident insurance. It covers expenses, losses, and suffering incurred by the insured because of accidents causing physical injury and any subsequent disability. It sometimes includes a lump sum payment to heirs if the insured dies due to the accident. Then there's all risk insurance. It covers all losses that the insured may incur, except those that are expressly excluded in the policy. Typical exclusions are losses due to war, pollution, earthquakes, and floods. Property owners often buy what is known as a rider or endorsement, which is an attachment to a standard policy and is not a standalone insurance product. It covers such losses like earthquakes or floods. Sometimes a rider for flood coverage, if you live in a flood zone, is required to get a mortgage loan. Surprisingly, though, there are over 16,000 fault lines in California. State law does not require earthquake insurance, though it does require coverage for fire damage that is caused by or follows an earthquake. The next type of major insurance is automobile insurance. 
It may cover damages to an automobile resulting from specified hazards or occurrences such as fire, vandalism, theft, or collision if these types of coverage are purchased. Normally, it covers liability for personal injuries and property damage resulting from the operation of a vehicle. Most states, including Kansas, require a minimum level of auto liability coverage before you can register a vehicle with the state. Liability only insurance covers damages to third parties and their property as a result of the accident, but does not cover the insured's vehicle or losses. To cover their own vehicle as the result of an auto accident, the insured needs to buy what's generally known in the trade as full coverage insurance that includes collision and comprehensive insurance. What you're technically doing is buying a rider for collision and comprehensive to add to your liability policy. A typical full coverage policy has liability, comprehensive and collision, uninsured motorist, and medical coverage. The next type of insurance is called casualty insurance, and it protects against losses incurred as a result of being held liable for personal injuries or property damage sustained by others. Next, we will discuss disability insurance. This replaces a portion of the insured's monthly income from employment in the event that illness or injury causes a short or long-term disability, usually for a set period of time, such as six to 12 months of payments for a short-term disability and up to five years of payments for a long-term disability. Many employers offer disability insurance to their employees as part of their insurance benefits. Then there is fire insurance. This covers losses to the insured caused by fire. Floater insurance covers movable property as long as the property is within the territorial boundaries specified in the policy. Very important type of insurance is homeowners insurance. This protects homeowners against some or all risks of loss to their residences, depending on the purchase of riders for certain causes of loss, such as flood or earthquake. These perils generally aren't included in a standard homeowners policy. It covers the home, other structures, such as a detached garage or shed, the contents of the house or the detached garage or shed, and liability resulting from the use of the property. A typical homeowner's policy will usually cover losses resulting from fire, lightning, wind, snow, and hail, and any resulting water damages from those perils, plus theft. Depending on the policy, it will include loss of use of the property, personal liability coverage for third-party liability, and medical payments coverage for injuries to guests. Homeowners generally covers four areas, your home, other structures on the property like a garage or a shed, personal property like furniture, clothes, or other household goods, and liability for third-party injuries and losses. However, a homeowner's car or boat parked in the driveway or even in the garage generally has to have its own insurance and is not usually covered by a standard homeowner's insurance policy. In contrast, if the car belongs to a third person, a visitor, and is parked on the homeowner's driveway and is damaged because one of the children breaks a window in the car with a baseball, the cost for repairing the car would be covered because that falls under third-party liability. The next type of insurance is key person insurance. It protects a business in the event of the death or disability of a key director, officer, or employee. Then there's liability insurance. This protects against liability imposed on the insured as a result of injuries to the person or properties of another. You often see liability sections in auto and homeowners policies that we just discussed. In the business setting, this is often known as commercial general liability insurance. It's called CGL insurance, and it covers the risk of loss as a result of daily business operations. CGL policies provide coverage to a business for bodily injury, personal injury, and property damage caused by the business's operations, products, or injuries that occur on the business's premises. Then there's life insurance. This covers the death of the policyholder and upon their death pays the amount of the policy to the insured's beneficiary. It can be whole life, which has a cash value, or term life, which has no cash value and for, is for a set term of years. Then there's major medical. This protects the insured against major hospital, medical, or surgical expenses. This is your health insurance that you get from your employer or perhaps through the Affordable Care Act exchange. 
The next type of major insurance is malpractice insurance. This is a form of liability insurance that protects professionals like lawyers, doctors, dentists, accountants, and architects, basically any qualified professional, against malpractice claims brought by clients or patients. Then there's renter's insurance. This covers the personal property damages of renters while living in a leased dwelling. Usually a landlord's property policy on the apartment building or other rental property does not cover the personal property of tenants. Like homeowner's insurance, renter's insurance does not generally cover losses from floods or earthquakes. Then there's umbrella coverage. If the insured is sued over an accident and the settlement exceeds the liability limits under an auto and or home insurance policy, this coverage takes over to further cover and insure its assets. Umbrella policies are secondary insurance. This just means that the, the coverage kicks in second after the auto or home insurance policy limits have been reached. Finally, there's workers' compensation. This is a form of insurance providing wage replacement and medical benefits to employees injured in the course of employment in exchange for mandatory relinquishment of the employee's right to sue his or her employer for negligence. Next, we will discuss insurable interests. A person must have an insurable interest in something in order to insure it from risk of loss. Now, this applies equally to legal and natural persons, meaning both an individual and a business have to have an insurable interest in something in order to insure it. Without an insurable interest, there is no enforceable insurance contract. The existence of an insurable interest is a primary element in determining liability under an insurance policy. This just means that if someone doesn't have an insurable interest and they make a claim under an insurance policy, the insurance company doesn't have to pay that claim. For property insurance, an insurable interest exists when the insured derives a monetary benefit from the preservation and continued existence of the property. The insurable interest must exist at the time loss occurs, but need not exist when the policy is purchased. For example, as soon as you sign on the contract for the purchase of a car, you have an insurable interest in the car, even if you do not take delivery, physical possession of the car, immediately. For property damage coverage, if all ownership interest in a property is transferred to another through sale or court order like a divorce decree, and loss occurs after the property's complete transfer, the party who no longer has an ownership interest in the property has no insurable interest. Let's take a look at an example. Larry and Betty are married and take out a homeowner's policy on their home. However, Larry and Betty divorce later, and as a result, Betty is awarded the marital home and must continue to pay the mortgage and insurance premiums under the divorce decree. If a fire later destroyed the house, Larry would have no insurable interest in the property and would not be entitled to any of the insurance proceeds, even if he was an original insured under the policy at the time it was purchased. All the proceeds would be paid to Betty as the sole property owner. In regard to life insurance, if the person insured is not themselves, meaning you're not buying a policy on your own life, a person must have a reasonable expectation of benefit from the continued life of another to have an insurable interest in that person's life. For example, a husband can take out a life insurance policy on the life of his wife, or a parent can take out a life insurance policy on the life of their child. In the business setting, key person insurance can be taken out by the business on the life of a key director, officer, or employee. The insurable interest must exist at the time the life insurance policy is obtained. Further, a life insurance policy taken out by one spouse on the other will remain valid even after a divorce, unless a specific policy provision provides for the termination of the policy upon divorce, and that's fairly common. In the business setting, if a company takes out a key person policy, if that key employee leaves the firm and subsequently dies, the company can still collect the benefit of the insurance as long as the premiums are paid or unless a provision in the policy terminates the policy if a key employee leaves for another company. Next, we will discuss the insurance contract. 
An insurance policy is just a contract and is governed by general contract law, usually under state common law and state statutory law, though federal law does also play a role. The insurance industry is usually heavily regulated by each state in terms of policy provisions, pricing and licensing of agents and brokers, as well as oversight and review of these companies to make sure that they are solvent and comply with insurance laws and regulations. In Kansas, the Kansas Insurance Department, headed by the Insurance Commissioner, regulates the insurance industry. Customarily, a person obtains insurance through an application for insurance to the insurance company who can either accept or reject the application. The acceptance may be conditional. For example, you can condition a life insurance policy on a medical exam of the insured person. The application form is usually attached to the policy and made part of the insurance contract. If an applicant makes material false statements on the application, it can void coverage, particularly if the insurer can show it would not have extended coverage based on the true facts. The effective date is the date on which insurance coverage begins. Any loss sustained before the effective date of the policy will not be covered. In some situations, coverage does not begin until a formal policy is issued. If an applicant is using a broker and the broker does not procure the policy, there's no interim coverage. However, in many situations, an applicant is covered between the time the application is received and the time the insurance company either accepts or rejects the application. If a person is dealing with the insurance company's agent, they are usually protected from the time of application if they make some form of premium payment. The agent will issue a memorandum or binder indicating that a policy is pending and stating its essential terms. The binder provides temporary interim coverage until a formal policy is accepted or denied. Next, we will discuss some key insurance contract provisions. Depending on the state, certain provisions in a policy may be required or prohibited depending on the statute. If a state statute or regulation requires a specific provision and it is left out, courts will interpret the policy as if the clause was present, in effect, reading the clause into the contract. Policy provisions are clauses in an insurance contract that lay out the exact conditions for which coverage is provided and for what amounts, along with exclusions and other restrictions. We will start with incontestability clauses. Many state statutes commonly require that a policy for life or health insurance include an incontestability clause. This clause provides that after a policy has been in force for a specified period of time, usually two or three years minimum, depending on the state, the insurer cannot contest statements made in the application meaning the insurer cannot defend a claim under the policy by claiming fraud on the part of the insured in the application. An incontestability clause does not prevent other defenses to a policy claim, such as non-payment of premiums, failure to file proof of death, or lack of an insurable interest. The next key insurance contract provision is the co-insurance clause. Often, when taking out fire insurance, property owners insure their property for less than full value because most fires do not result in a total loss of the building. To encourage property owners to insure their property for as close to full value as possible, fire insurance generally includes a co-insurance clause. In the event of a partial loss due to fire, a co-insurance clause determines what percentage of the value of the property must be insured for an owner to be fully reimbursed for the loss. If the owner insures the property up to a specified percentage, usually 80% of its value, they will recover any loss up to the face value of the policy. If the insurance is for less than the specified value of percentage, the owner is responsible for a proportionate share of the loss. The owner, in effect, becomes a co-insurer. That's why they call it the co-insurance clause. For example, 
Suppose ABC Corporation has a building worth $200,000 and takes out a policy for $160,000. If the required percentage of value is 80%, then the policy amount is sufficient and ABC will recover all of its loss in the event of a fire up to the policy limit of $160,000. However, if ABC Corporation only takes out a $100,000 policy, then because that's only 50% of the value, ABC Corp will not recover the full amount of the loss up to policy limits. For example, if there's a fire that causes an $80,000 loss, then ABC will have to foot the bill for part of that loss. There's actually a formula that you can use to calculate how much they would pay, but I don't expect you to know that. What I expect you to know is what's on the slides. The next key insurance contract provision is the appraisal clause. Insurance policies frequently provide that the parties cannot agree on the amount of a loss covered under the policy or the value of the property lost, then an appraisal or an estimate by an impartial and qualified third party can be demanded by either party, by either the insured or the insurer. Then there is the arbitration clause. Many insurance policies include clauses that call for arbitration of any dispute that arises between the insured and the insurer concerning the settlement of claims. Then there is the multiple insurance clause. This clause states that if the insured has multiple insurance policies that cover the same property and the amount of the insurance exceeds the loss, the loss will be shared proportionately by the insurance companies. Then there is the anti-lapse clause. This provides that a life insurance policy will not automatically lapse if no payment is made on the due date, meaning that the policy will have a grace period, usually 30 or 31 days, within which an insured can pay an overdue premium before the policy is canceled. Next, we will discuss interpretation of insurance contracts. Courts generally recognize that most people are not experts in the terms and provisions in an insurance contract and that individuals have very little power to negotiate the terms and provisions in standard insurance contract. Remember, the individual has very little bargaining power with the big insurance company, so they have very little ability to set terms. When interpreting insurance contracts, courts will interpret the words used in an insurance policy according to their ordinary meanings in light of the nature of the coverage involved. More importantly, if there's an ambiguity in the policy terms, courts generally interpret the provision against the insurance company. If there's an ambiguity because the insurance company drafted the document, then the insured who did not draft the document gets the benefit of the doubt. If it is unclear whether an insurance contract actually exists because the written policy has not been delivered, the uncertainty is resolved against the insurance company. Insurers must make sure that the insured is adequately notified of any change in coverage under an existing policy or the change will not be enforced in court. On this slide, I've laid out the duties and obligations of the parties. First, we'll start with the duties of the insured. An applicant for insurance has the duty of good faith to reveal any necessary facts for the insurer to evaluate the risk of issuing the policy. Once the policy is issued, the insured has three basic duties. To pay the stated premiums, to notify the insurer within a reasonable period of time if an event occurs that gives rise to a claim, and to cooperate with the insurer during any investigation or litigation. Next, we will discuss the duties of the insurer. If there is a claim, the insurer has a duty to investigate a claim and must make reasonable efforts to settle the claim with the insured or any third party claimant. The insurer has a duty to defend the insured, including paying attorney's fees and costs in any lawsuits based on a claim regardless of merit. The insurer has a duty to pay any legitimate claim up to the face value of the policy. Most states recognize a cause of action against insurance companies for bad faith denial of claims or refusal to settle claims. Damages can exceed the policy limits and inc can include punitive damages. The final topic we're going to cover in this lesson is cancellation of insurance policies. An insured can cancel an insurance policy at any time. 
an insurer can cancel a policy under certain circumstances, though most states require that an insurer give advance written notice of any cancellation. In many states, including Kansas, the insurer must also give notice of a right to cure the default if the insured is a consumer under some default circumstances, particularly non-payment. An insurer may cancel an insurance policy for various reasons depending on the type of insurance. For example, automobile policies can be canceled for non-payment of premiums or suspension of the insured's driver's license. Property insurance can be canceled for non-payment or for reasons such as the insured's fraud or misrepresentation, gross negligence, or conviction of a crime that increases the risk assumed by the insurer. Life and health insurance can be canceled because of materially false statements made by the insured, but only in the period designated in the incontestability clause. Once the incontestability clause kicks in, the insured is protected and the insurer cannot cancel the policy based on statements made in the application. An insurer cannot cancel a policy or refuse to renew it for discriminatory reasons or for reasons that violate public policy. This is the end of the insurance supplement.